Hello and welcome to this special edition of Middle East Matters where we'll be focusing on the aftermath of last week's deadly earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Tens of thousands dead and millions in desperate need of basic foodstuffs, water, shelter and medical aid. Frustration mounts over the inadequate response of Ankara and Damascus, both governments accused of a lack of leadership and accountability and of mismanaging relief efforts. In war-torn and politically isolated Syria, some fear the outpouring of global support could give the Bashar al-Assad regime an opportunity to renew diplomatic relations with the wider world. Well, as rescue operations wind down, the focus is switching to the massive humanitarian crisis in the wake of last week's disaster. The UN says more aid is on the way, but survivors, including more than a million children, will need long-term assistance. In Turkey, many of the victims had already fled devastation in Syria, having endured bombardments, chemical attacks and starvation during more than a decade of civil war. Those who survived this latest tragedy are now living in the shadows of broken buildings in devastated cities like Karaman Marash without access to food, water or electricity. Days after the quake, still the bodies come. We're near the epicentre in Karaman Marash, a city home to many Syrian refugees. And for the children here who've already lived so much during the war, the trauma is clear. Twelve-year-old Mohammed is from Hama in central Syria. He's taking us to meet his family. They've survived the quake, but their house has been badly damaged. Even though it isn't safe, they have nowhere else to go. I'm scared. Whenever I go to my room, I think it will move and collapse and then make a lot of noise. It's not just me who's scared. My siblings are too. My sister's too afraid to go into our home. The roof is broken and that scares us as well. These children have never known a time without war in Syria. And now Mother Nature has struck their home away from home, their safe haven gone in a night. The day after the quake, the children were struggling psychologically. But they've been forced to adapt because of the war in Syria. Every time they go out, they fear another quake or a bomb dropped by Bashar. With millions in need here, the security situation is fragile. Looting is becoming more common and some are blaming Syrian refugees. The police treated us badly. I was trying to take some wood to warm my family and it made me throw it away. They accused me of being a thief. Am I a thief with this injured hand? I was helping Turkish people. I stayed two days and helped them, me and my kid. This is a region where communities have coexisted for centuries. But even before the quake, there were growing tensions between Turks and Syrians. And now, for families like these, there are real questions about what comes next. Many blame faulty construction for the vast devastation wreaked by the quakes. Turkish authorities are targeting contractors allegedly linked with some of the buildings that collapsed. But critics say the government is trying to shift the blame for a disaster that's exposed its own corruption and negligence. Well, to discuss the political fallout, we're joined now by Turkish journalist Yavuz Baydar. Firstly, Yavuz, Erdogan, he's weakened NGOs over the years by restricting their financing, forcing many of them to shut down. In the longer term, how will this affect the government response to the quake? Uh, the government's response is, is pretty clear. Turkey uh, has a very centralized administrative system under Erdogan. And uh, in the latest, in the final days, in the coming, the, the, the latest days, we see that uh, there have been two uh, major civilian initiatives, uh, non-official initiatives, that have been quite efficient as the, uh, the centralized uh, efforts were paralyzed 
And these two are under attack uh, by the trolls and uh, by the non-pro-government media. And state of emergency, of course, allows Erdogan to seize uh, the, all the donations and, uh, and the accumulations of material these, these two, institution, these two uh, civilian initiatives have. So people are worried that uh, that will be the case. Yes, and talking about concerns about corruption, in terms of how resources for reconstruction will be allocated and whether or not those responsible will be held accountable for their failures. What kind of concerns are you seeing around that? The uh, earthquakes, two earthquakes, exposed unearthed enormous level of corruption, uh, an, an unprecedented level. And uh, impunity is part of the, the Turkish uh, political culture. And uh, also uh, the blame game is very easy for all the powers to, to put on uh, whoever or whatever else except themselves. So uh, those contractors uh, uh, have been known, many of them have been known to, to be uh, uh, responsible for, for the damage, but the corruption levels show that almost each and every uh, level there have been uh, extreme uh, you know, levels of, of, of corruption uh, in, in short. And this was um, shown by the uh, figures that we have uh, in uh, past 70 years, more, more than 70 years, that uh, 19 pardons for building uh, codes uh, have been issued for various governments, but also impunity uh, is a case since 1999, uh, more than 2,500 2, cases, lawsuits were filed against the contractors, but only 110 of them were, were pursued. So uh, again, the, those responsible would hope that they will go free. Uh, and um, also uh, the challenge is enormous because according to a BBC study, uh, more than half of the ha buildings in Turkey, uh, more than 13 millions in total, are without proper building codes. So it shows how uh, deep the corruption is in, the, in, the, in, in Turkey. Now, even before this tragedy, Erdogan had been facing into his toughest election in two decades. How will the criticism of his handling of this disaster affect his prospects in June? Uh, Erdogan is cornered more than ever. Uh, he's, he had challenges before, but this one is the most serious challenge that he's facing. And infuriated uh, opposition is pushing him into a further into a corner. He doesn't have much leverage in terms of... Uh, constitution, he cannot postpone the elections, uh, the pressure will be on him to hold the elections in its ordinary date, latest, June 18. And we will see what kind of political choreography he will, uh, he will show for us. That will be exciting to see. Just briefly and finally, Erdogan claims that the criticism against him is politically motivated. Is there a sense that the opposition may be taking advantage of the situation? Uh, opposition is uh, scattered and all fragmented, and it, it's, uh, it has been like this. But this disaster may, uh, may show, may push it into a unity, and uh, expectations from the uh, people, the voters who are critical of the government, is that they will act in uh, unity and uh, stand for, the, for their uh, demands that the election, elections will be held in June 18. Okay, Yavuz, thank you so much for your time. That is Turkish journalist Yavuz Baydar. Well, Syria has been politically isolated due to the brutal decade-long civil war, but the devastating earthquake has led to an outpouring of aid offers from around the world. The humanitarian support is gravely needed, but it could also present an opportunity for President Bashar al-Assad to renew some diplomatic relations. Charlie James has more. As Syria battles the earthquake's aftermath, President Bashar al-Assad agrees to open two more border crossings to bring in much-needed humanitarian aid. Assad met with UN aid chief Martin Griffiths Monday, a rare act of cooperation from the man spearheading a brutal 12-year civil war. President al-Assad confirmed the need for urgent aid to enter all region in Syria including those under occupation and under control of the armed terrorist groups. Politically isolated for much of the last decade, Assad has received calls of support from many Arab leaders since the devastating earthquake. 
Tuesday, a Saudi Arabian plane carrying 35 tons of food aid landed in Aleppo, the first flight between the countries in over 10 years. And humanitarian supplies have arrived from all over the world, from China and Romania to the United Arab Emirates. But some in the international community are suspicious of Assad's intentions, saying he may try to exploit the situation to regain political legitimacy. The Assad regime has uh, consistently argued against uh, additional humanitarian crossings, uh, but if uh, the regime is serious about this uh, and uh, if the regime is willing to put those words uh, into action, that would be a good thing for the Syrian people. For victims, the aid is severely needed. The rebel-held Northwest has received little help, and a week after the earthquake, even many in government strongholds haven't either. With freezing, we didn't get any aid at all. No one came to us. No one asked us what we need. Nothing at all. The situation is dire. During a disaster, politics is often put on hold to save lives. Situational support from world leaders doesn't mean the Syrian regime is back on the path to international respect. Well, that's it for this week's special edition of Middle East Matters. Do stay with us for more international news here on France 24. Bienvenidos a las noticias de France 24. Thanks very much for joining us. And um, before... Hello, Mikon Fi, Thakafa, Fi Adad Alion. Ravi de vous retrouver pour Afrique Hebdo au programme cette semaine. Nous n'avons pas de la fin ou de l'autre. Bien retour sur la médiatique. This storm has hit New York City. A lot of hard work. Madagascar fait face à une seconde vague meurtrière. Almost 99 million of you watch us every week. So thank you. Shukran. Gracias. Your confidence means a lot to us. Muchas gracias. Shukran. Thank you. Merci du fond de mon cœur. Liberté, égalité, actualité. Revisiting the fight of Rute, the president of the Association of Peruvian Women subjected to forced sterilization in the 90s. We've been fighting for more than 25 years, and we will continue until we get the truth, justice and compensation. She listens. These are the results of all the medical exams I've had, because I've not been well since my tubes are tied. She supports. We need to be respected, because you're not alone. And above all, she does not give up. Now is the time to apologize. Watch Rute and her quest for justice in Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. The world is ever changing. The news doesn't wait. France 24 gives a global perspective that an educated, intelligent, and active viewer is going to want to have to be able to fully understand the issues of the day. That's why it will always be there to help make sense of world events. J'ai l'habitude de suivre France 24 partout où je me trouve. Et ce, grâce à mon smartphone, parce que je ne reste pas souvent devant la télé. Quand une information circule sur la toile, j'utilise l'application de France 24 pour vérifier l'authenticité. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what, France 24 is with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité. actualité.